Well, fast forward 20 years later, the world is concerned about the United States' sovereign debt, and Russia, which actually defaulted on its debt in 1998, is now outperforming most of the world. It's something my next guest has pointed out. She's an economist with ACM Partners, Margaret Bogenreef. She joins us to tell us if and how the U.S. should be taking notes. Thanks so much for being with us. Now, you make the case uh, in a recent article I read of yours that the U.S., as it stood poised for default, Russia's economy is looking really good and really is the exciting growth story for the BRICS countries. Looking back, of course, Russia was a country that had to go through a lot of pain in order to get to where it is today, including shock therapy in the 90s, as we saw in that report. So do you see any lessons in that for the United States? Well, I think Russia obviously offers an interesting lesson in shock therapy, but I don't think it's actually an applicable one for the United States. So let's take a look at Russia in 1998. In, 19, in August 1998, Russia was only seven years out of communism. So when the government decided to devalue the currency, to default on domestic debt, to stop paying foreign creditors, it was a shock that the system not only could bear, but needed in order to reset itself. Mm -hmm. Looking at the United States now, if we enacted any one of those policies, it would cause so much harm and make the global economy so unstable, mm -hmm. I don't know how we or many of our trading partners could ever come out of it. So while Russia offers a very interesting case, you do have to remember that there was quite a bit of built up demand in entrepreneurism, waiting in the wings, mm -hmm. waiting for a shock to occur so that it could then, you know, pull itself back to a new normal. The United States doesn't have that. We are too tied to the global economy. Remember, we are still the reserve currency, no matter what right, people right. say. We still have, you know, quite a bit of ties to the world, obviously our trading partners and, you know, the world really looks to us for, you know, economics and, you know, other leadership. If we were to do any one of those three things that Russia did, it would impact the world so devastatingly and our trade partners, mm -hmm. I don't think we would the world could ever recover. So while Russia offers an interesting example, I actually think a better one is Japan in the 90s. Japan oh, and, had a and, there, and there are many comparisons for the United States to Japan that we've seen and that we've talked about on this show. But I do want to bring up just the issue of priorities, because something that you see even in the shock therapy that Russia endured were priorities where, you know, the market maybe got the therapy, but the people got the shock and they, they dealt with unemployment and poverty and very serious amounts of pain. Is there anything that the United States needs to be considering as far as pain? I mean, can you get out of a crisis like the United States is in? Because even though it's the reserve currency, many people are very concerned about the U.S. debt, say the U.S. can never pay its bills. Uh, can you get out of that situation and get out of the economic doldrums that the U.S. is in, even with jobs, without enduring pain? I actually really like that question, and here's why. Right now, there's a big debate going on in the United States regarding Keynesian economics. Should the government pump more money into the economy? I know Paul Krugman is a big fan of debating Keynesian economics. Here's the problem. There's a difference between politics and economics. So while a case could be made for the Keynesian approach, the government pumps more money into the economy, the economy slowly recovers, demand increases, job increase, jobs increase. Well, I think a case could be made for that. Wherever you stand on the issue, that's pol politically un infeasible. I, I don't think anybody is going to ever push that, particularly right now with this current administration and Congress. So kind of taking a step back and looking at solutions, yeah, I think there is an issue of priorities. And I do think, you know, there is, I know that conservatives love to argue about class warfare and, you know, people are just trying to rile people up against, you know, the upper classes. I think tax, tax codes and, you know, what we ask of our wealthiest system, mm -hmm. uh, of our wealthiest citizens, really is part of the problem. I really do. I think the tenor of the debate has become so charged that there's almost not a feasible answer, particularly from the government end. So, yeah, I do believe that there will be more pain. I think the best answer lies in you know, restating and redoing our tax codes. Okay. So then who should endure that pain, though? Do you go squeeze the richest top 1% of the country that controls a third of the wealth in the U.S. to pay for 
programs like entitlements that are broke, uh, you know, help the poor, help the uh, old that, that are guaranteed money, or do you squeeze the larger portion, um, the poor, the poorest 50% who control just a few percent of the wealth in this country, but who are living off of government welfare for their food, for their health care, uh, for unemployment in record numbers, especially when it comes to examples such as food stamps. And stats show that 59% of people get some form of government assistance. So who do you squeeze? I love the way you phrase that question. Here's what wealth inequality shows to us, particularly in economics. It shows us where the money is. Mm -hmm. And I love the way you phrase that, the 50%, you know, underneath the top 1%, do we squeeze them? Sure. I mean, knock yourself out right now politically. That's what is winning in Congress right now. Here's the problem. There's only so much you can squeeze from those people. They aren't generating more income. They aren't generating more wealth. They aren't the significant wealth holders in the United States. So you can cut off aid and cut off and cut off and cut off. Where, where does that lead? You're only cutting things off. You're not stimulating anything. Mm -hmm. So I liked your point about pain and you know the upper versus the lower classes because I think what the wealth inequality debate should be instructing people, which it's not, is there's a great vast untapped portion of our citizenry that is not paying its fair share. So, you know, they're the ones who traditionally control the debate and control power, and that's why they're not paying their fair share. Look, you can hurt grandmothers all you want, but at the end of the day, they can only pay so much. And they can only curb the pain so much. So there has to be a more feasible answer moving forward. So you think, so just in short, you think that the rich should be taxed more and contribute more to pay for some of those programs that are guaranteed for the sick, the poor, that sort of thing. Absolutely. I think um, I, I think looking at it, you know, the, the rich love to claim, and again, I'm speaking very broadly, so please, you know, understand that. But the rich and particularly conservatives really like to argue, look, I earned my money here. This is a meritocracy. I worked hard. I got it. Sure. The United States was also created with the idea that you earn your keep and you pay your keep. Mm -hmm. And I think the big issue is so many conservatives say, look, I've made Paying my money, I should be able to keep it. Yeah, nobody's saying that you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. But just because you earned it doesn't mean you deserve the right to not pay taxes and demand people underneath you pay crippling amounts and you don't simply because you earned more. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that's basically what the debate comes down to. I just want to make the point, along with what you're saying, I want to bring up, I think we have a picture of the Ferrari that is selling out. The Ferrari and the Lamborghini that were just uh, released, essentially, they're already all sold out. They're about $400,000, which uh, a lot of those orders coming from the United States. So they're not even out. They're sold out for their first model year. Tons of money. Does this, yes or no, does this further make your case that there are people that can afford to pay more? Yeah, I think it does. I think it shows that we've created this great system where people, hedge fund managers, traders, investment bankers, you know, I'm just using Wall Street because I'm in finance can make an exorbitant amount of money. Look, I have no problem with people spending their money however they want, but what I think it does demonstrate is we've created a system in which that's allowed and welcome and celebrated, but it's intellectually dishonest to say, well, you know, I want to pull up the ladder now that I'm on top. No, we, you know, pre, pre kind of this generation, there was always an idea that you get some and you pay some back. And for some reason, the United States has just lost focus on that. At the same time, though, when you look at the broader global economy, the countries that we're talking about that are great growth stories are the BRICS countries that are seeing this growth in their economy, and they have a really different model. They don't take care of their poor and their elderly at all in the same way that the U.S. and that Europe can. So can the U.S. grow ever the way that it used to or the way the BRICS countries are while it has this model for government welfare assistance? Well, I think what's interesting about that is the United States is no longer the exceptional story of the world. I think that that's what this debt crisis really showed. I mean, it's it's been happening for the last 20 to 30 years, but ours is truly now a global economy and a global society. So there are going to be lessons learned from different areas and different economies that will work for some and won't work for others. I mean, whatever your stance on this issue, we have, I hate to use the word promise, but we do have this social net Mm -hmm. in place. It's a strong tenet for, you know, the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, the BRIC countries do offer great examples. I don't think the United States should go rushing to imitate Brazil's, you know, approach. Brazil mm -hmm. is a different type of capitalism than the United States. So do I think lessons can be learned in the future? Absolutely. That's what's so great about global economies. But the issue is, I don't think the United States should be using those right now as an example 
for how to argue to, you know, cut off grandma's heat. I don't think that's intellectually honest at all. Okay, I do want to ask in reality to just keep this conversation going for one more minute because I want to get to this issue of uh, the corporate tax holiday. So you're saying that the wealthy need to be uh, paid more of their fair share, pay more money. At the same time, we see more uh, bipartisan support in Congress for a corporate tax holiday. The argument being that if companies bring their money back from overseas where they have it in tax havens and their tax is just 5% instead of 35%, which is the corporate tax right here, then they'll reinvest their money in jobs. But critics point to a couple holes in their argument, one being that corporations are sitting on tons of cash already, which they're not investing, and the second being that that corporate tax holiday didn't work back in 2004 when there was one. And here's an example of that. The argument is if they bring home cash from overseas and are given a tax break to do that, that that'll enable them to spend cash in the economy now. But U.S. companies are already sitting on a record pile of cash, almost $2 trillion, according to the Federal Reserve. Um, that actually isn't what I was referring to. I was referring to an example where HP uh, brought the money back, and then in the same year, I believe, laid off you know, 14,000 people. So clearly, getting that money didn't result in them investing in jobs here. So my question is, why can't you or I keep money abroad and bring it back without being taxed at normal rates, but corporations might be able to? That's a great question. I think taking a broader, more macroeconomic look at this, here's what governments and policymakers need to understand. Policy corrections only work on the margins the majority of the time, and here's why. Unless the policy is so grossly and poorly enacted and it makes absolutely no sense, you're only going to see a shift on the margins of either spending, demand, or, you know, like you said, job creation. So you look at a corporate tax holiday. So corporations bring more money back to the United States. That's great. What happens? I don't know. I don't have any more money. I'm not going to buy what they're selling. Mm -hmm. That doesn't increase demand. Last quarter's GDP numbers were 1.3% growth. That's not even growth. That's a recovery list recovery is what I would call it. So you could enact corporate tax holidays. All that's going to happen is, you know, people are going to buy more $400,000 cars. Is that <laughs> helping our economy? Is that creating jobs here? No, it's not. It's just another example of, you know, over-politicized opinion and look at economics. Right, except that's what people focus on as a solution. But I want to thank you so much for your analysis on all of this. That was Margaret Bogenreef. She's economist at ACM Partners.